achieved. Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson. And in this edition of the show, we're going to be taking a look at UFC 147, Silva versus Franklin 2, which takes place on June 23rd, only one day removed from the UFC on FX4 card, which takes place on the Friday, the 22nd of June. UFC 147 is going down in Brazil, and this card has a lot of controversy surrounding it. It's a pay-per-view, but it's also the finale for Ultimate Fighter Brazil, and of course people are saying, why do we get, you know, the majority of this card is Ultimate Fighter Brazil competitors facing off along with the two finals, uh, and I'll talk about that in a second. Now the main event definitely has changed, uh, has had some multiple changes. Originally, Anderson Silva defending his middleweight title against Chael Sonnen, that got scrapped and moved to UFC 148. Then, so the co-main event, Vitor Belfort versus Vanderlei Silva, the coaches, bumped up in the main event slot. Vitor has to pull out due to injury, so Rich Franklin gets moved in. He'll face Vanderlei in a rematch of the original fight, fight which Franklin won a three-rounder. That was an excellent fight. This one's going to be five rounds. It should be fantastic. Uh, heavyweights for Bricio Verdum and Mike Russell get moved up into the co-main event spot, so I'm doing predictions for both of those. And I'm also providing predictions for two featherweight matchups. That's all I'm going to do. I just don't have the time right now. I'm actually going away on the upcoming weekend, so I will be... I just don't have... I actually missed this event, so I'll have to catch it on the recap uh, when I get back. Uh, now, for those of you who are wanting predictions for the two Ultimate Fighter Finals, head over to the website, kamikazegoverdrive.net, Joe Caporelli, my Bellator predictor. We'll be breaking both of those fights down, giving you his predictions for those, so you can check them out there. Also available at my website is the Bet Pack. No UFC 147 specific Bet Pack, but the four fights I'm breaking down here, I'm going to include them in my UFC FX Bet Pack. So you can buy that one, and you get all the information, the individual fight bet breakdowns. I'll include, I'll mix them together. I'll include who I think is most confident between the two cards. Because when you have two cards within two, di you know, two days, you can include them. You can work them together when you're doing your betting. It's certainly a, a plausible strategy. Uh, also, trying another thing out, I, as I said before, I created a forum on my website. I did a little forum community contest. If you go into the Kamikaze Overdrive community, you can see it under Kamikaze Overdrive Predictions. You can go in, there's a thread. Post your predictions for every single fight on the UFC on FX4 card. Winner and outcome, so either sub, decision, or KO slash TKO. You can see the rules there. Also, give me fight of the night, submission of the night, and knockout of the night. There's a point structure. The winner who gets the most points at that event, I will ship them the UFC 148 bet card password for free. The bet package that I do, so $10 value, I'll ship it out to you for free. You have a chance to you know, check out what I do there. And again, I don't guarantee anything. All I tell you is I've researched and I have piles of notes and experience. I watch fights like crazy. I have an extensive fight library I review constantly. And that's where I can give you my opinion. I can tell you what you want to hear. I can tell you as much as I can tell you. But I don't guarantee anything. You have to go through and, you know, see what you like of the information. And I've had a lot of success recently. I've also had some down times. I'm not going to lie to you in that sense. But either way, and you can always check out the results of my bet packs in my post-fight betting results. I always post them because it's very important that people be able to see what I'm talking about when things are all over. Uh, thank you very much to all of my sponsors, as always, MMABettingOdds.com. CouchFighter.co, MMAcrips.com, and everyone else who hosts and posts my videos. ShareDog is a great one. They always let me post my videos in their forum, and I love to hear from those guys. Sometimes you don't always agree with my picks, and that's fine. I don't have, I'm not one of these guys who has an opinion that I think is the absolute, you know, is written in stone. I'm wrong all the time. It happens. That's the way life is. So if you have an opinion that differs from mine, please feel free to tell me, but back it up. Don't just tell me I'm stupid or call me a nickname or name and whatever. Please feel free to voice it, but educa be educated when you back it up. And of course, thank you very much to all my followers followers from YouTube. You know who you are, the guys who have uh, supported me from the beginning. Grateful to all of those individuals. Too many to name right now online, but you definitely know who you are, guys. I communicate and talk with all of the time. Hopefully I'll see some of you guys in the forum. I'm rambling. I'm going to want to get to my first prediction. Let's get there. So my first prediction is in the UFC featherweight division. This is a Facebook preliminary fight between Felipe Arantes, 14-4-0, against new UFC newcomer Milton Vieira, 13-7-1. Arantes will be fighting for the third time in the UFC. He debuted back at UFC 134 against fellow countryman Yuri Alcantara, losing a decision. Rebounded at UFC 142 with a decision victory over Antonio Carvalho. So he's 1-1 in the company. All, this will be his third fight for UFC, and of course all of them in Brazil, so that's you know definitely his home country. Certainly will have support there. Now, Milton Vieira, fellow Brazilian, so certainly will have some fans in the crowd. His last win was a, a submission victory 
uh, back in August uh, August 12, 2011. So he's been out of action for a little bit. And it was on the Strike Force card, Gurgel versus Duarte, Duarte. And he won the fight by Brambo Choke. He's got some experience. He's taken on a couple fellow UFC fighters, Johnny Eduardo. And he took on Jake Shields back in 2003. So the guy's, you know, he might not be well known, but he got a, he has a lot of experience coming into this. He had a one fight stint in Pride. So he's been around and certainly a capable fighter. Now, looking at how these two guys break down, Milton Vieira, he is a black belt in Luta Livre, a second-degree black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. So high-level grappling, and his, his win-loss totals show up. Nine wins by submission. He's got 13 wins overall, nine by submission. He's never been tapped out. No wins or losses by knockout. Four wins by decision, seven wins by losses. So his submission game is his bread and butter. Arantes on the other half side, most of his wins, the majority, six wins by uh, knockout, four wins by submission, four wins by decision. Arantes certainly capable on the ground. He's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu purple belt, but he's going to want to keep this fight st standing. He has excellent Muay Thai. He's got a lot of power. I really like his aggressive st uh, striking style. He throws a lot of kicks. He's creative with the striking, and he will explode. Now, having said that, in his fights uh, with Alcantara and against Carvalho, his aggressive style did leave openings for takedowns, and Carvalho was able to capitalize on it, put him on his back early, and was able to control him in the early onset of that fight faded a little bit which gave Arantes the ability to keep the fight standing and use his striking but going back to the Yuri Alcantara fight Alcantara attempted six takedowns completed all six and that's the big number that stands out to me Milton Vieira is a dangerous submission fighter prefers the Brambo choke back-to-back -back wins via Brambo choke and the guy can you know if he can get a, his hands on you you are in trouble against Sterling Ford in the uh, his last fight at Strike Force, he locked in a standing guillotine Tran took, dragged him to the ground, transitioned to the Brambo choke, didn't get it initially, you know, dropped a little bit of ground and pound, softened him up, locked in the Brambo choke again, and put him to sleep. It was fantastic and very well executed. He has excellent takedowns. He does a nice job setting up with his strikes. He will, as I said, he will go from the clinch for a takedown. And he also has good timing. He's able to slide under an opponent's kicks or strikes and put him on their back, which is something Arantes will have to watch out for. Again, good top control for Vieira with his ground and pound. He keeps tight on his opponent, does not allow them a lot of room to move, and he does a nice job of advancing his position and moving towards mount. So essentially the way I look at this, if Arantes can keep it standing, he wins this fight. Uh, I saw Vieira against Johnny Eduardo, and Eduardo was lighting him up with the striking, but he left openings and allowed Vieira to get the fight to the ground and eventually uh, defeat him. If Vieira gets the fight to the ground with regularity, he can win this fight. Conditioning might be an issue with Vieira. I've seen some fights where he got tired, but he, he fights at a high pace early. But I think he should be able to do enough early to definitely get things going. Another big number that stands out to me, Vieira is a very big featherweight. He comes in at 6 feet tall compared to Arantes at 5 foot 8. And when you have a big man that, that size on top of you, it's going to take its toll. And I, I really can... I would be concerned for Arantes if he cannot defend the takedowns early. And I think Milton Vieira, his grappling advantage will be significant. I hope he doesn't have issues with making his UFC debut, but being in Brazil will certainly will help him. I like Arantes. He's a very talented fighter. But stylistically, I think Milton Vieira gives him some issues. So I'm going to take Milton Vieira to be victorious in his UFC debut. I'm going to take him to defeat Felipe Arantes by submission. Continuing the UFC featherweight division, we're moving to the main card, though. Now, and this fight actually is going to raise the curtain on the main card based on the schedule. I have veteran Yuri Alcantara, 26-3-0, takes on, again, another UFC newcomer in Hakran Diaz, 21-1. So two guys with fantastic records. Looking at Alcantara, he's a perfect 3-0 in his Zufa career. He has lone WEC appearance with a KO knockout of Ricardo Lamas, and then back-to-back -back decision wins over Felipe Arantes and Michihiro Omagawa. So he's looking to improve to 4-0. And, and the guy's a fantastic fighter. Comes in with a combined 12 submissions, 11 knockouts, so 23 finishes in 30 career fights. You cannot deny that's impressive no matter what competition you're taking on. Hakran Diaz, on the other hand, hasn't faced a level of competition, at least on the main stage, the North American stage, that Yuri Alcantara has, but the guy's got an equally as impressive record. Nine wins by submission, three by knockout, and, you know, eight wins by decision. His lone loss was by decision. It came back in 2009. So the guy's riding, what is he riding here, a seven-fight winning streak? <laughs> Nothing you can sneeze at there. Yuri Alcantara just as impressive, quickly doing some math. He's on a 12-fight winning streak. So, again, these two guys, one of their, you know, streaks comes to an end. This is a big fight. Uh, I know a lot of people aren't talking about it that much because Diaz, relative unknown in UFC, making his debut, but it's a very good fight as far as I am concerned. Now we know all about Yuri Alcantara. The guy's got excellent striking. We saw him against Michihiro Omagawa, and Omagawa is a tough dude, and Alcantara took it to him early. He has nice, you know, good striking, straight punches. He utilized a lot of knees to the body in that fight, and he clearly hurt Omagawa right off the bat in that fight with a knee to the body. 
He's got a nice one-two. He'll throw a straight left ball with a right hook. And he mixes things up. Spinning back fist put uh, Omagawa on his back, which was, you know, that was very impressive when he did it. He's, pr he's very good on the mat. Twelve wins by submission. Again, he took his back flawlessly. He hasn't been able to finish. He is a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I said he hasn't been able to finish in the UFC when he had opportunities. Now, on the other side of things, Hakran Diaz, I've seen a lot of footage of him in, in lower comp against lower competition or less, lesser organizations. He's an aggressive striker. He mixes up his boxing very well. Uh, and he has pretty good takedowns, and he utilizes his speed effectively. He has good top control when he can, can get on top. He stays very active, and he will attempt multiple subs, and he does a very nice job of advancing his position and uh, looking to improve his you know, opportunities for submissions. Uh, going back to the feet, if he is able to clinch up, he has a body lock takedown with trips, and he does a nice job of passing the guard, as I said already, when he gets in that position. Uh, in his last second last fight, uh, he took on alpha male product Eddie Hawk, and he was able to put Hawk on his back several times before submitting him. And Hawk's a former wrestler, which was very impressive. Uh, Diaz was able to do what he was able to do in that situation. And again, he's constantly threatening with submissions. He's the type of guy who just seems to be able to pull him out of nowhere. He rolls for an arm, he rolls for a leg, and all of a sudden his opponent's tapping or is in a serious amount of trouble. Now, the way we look, I look at this fight is Alcantara's... I, I give Alcantara an edge with the striking. But I've seen signs that Yuri has some issues, A, with conditioning. Against Omagawa, a fight he dominated for the first two rounds. In round three, he looked very stiff and looked kind of exhausted. And I saw in that fight, Omagawa, with his judo, was able to get in the range, and he had moments where he was able to put Alcantara on his back and give him some diff trouble. Now, Alcantara did lock up a submission, a dangerous, nasty-looking armbar that many people thought broke uh, Michihiro's arm at the end of round one. But I will give Diaz the... the uh, dis advantage on the ground. And the way I look at this fight, the, I've seen the betting odds for this, and I don't think here, uh, Hakran Diaz is nearly as big an underdog as the betting odds would like to, uh, you to believe, simply because we do not know, or at least a lot of people aren't familiar with him, so they're going to be jumping on Alcantara because we've seen him so much. And actually in this fight, I think Diaz will be able to do enough with his striking, and he'll be able to mix in his grappling for the through over the three rounds to make a significant difference. And I'm going to take Hakran Diaz to defeat uh, Yuri Alcantara, and I'm going to take him to win this fight by decision. We move along now to the heavyweights, the big boys. Fabricio Verdum, 15-5-1, takes on Mike Russo, 15-1-0. And this is a very interesting fight. Verdum is nearly, I think he's closing in a potential shot at the title, very close anyway, another win or two, and he's definitely there. Mike Russell, the guy's on an absolute tear. Uh, quickly taking a look at his overall record, he has won 10 fights in a row, going all the way back to Pride 33, where he was submitted by Sergei Haritanov which is his lone loss of his career, matter of fact, so very impressive in that sense. And this is the type of fight that Russo has been missing out on over his career. In his UFC run, he's a perfect 4-0, and defeating Justin McCulley, Todd Duffy, John Madsen, and his last fight, John Olavinamo. 4-0 and in the UFC is a fantastic record, but he's really missing that big-time established name. I'd say up to this point, Todd Duffy was his biggest victory in the UFC. Now he's facing Verdum. A win here for Russo, and he is suddenly goes from a fringe contender to a guy right in the mix. Verdum, on the other hand, he's been around for a while. This is his second stint in the UFC. It's well documented, and he looked very impressive at UFC 143, destroying Roy Nelson. Roy Nelson's a tough dude, and Verdum beat him up worse than Junior Dos Santos did, worse than Frank Mir did. It was very impressive. Prior to that, he had lost Alistair Overeem, but he had a pretty impressive win streak uh, following his loss to Junior Dos Santos and eventually being cut by the UFC when he went to strike force, defeating Mike Kyle, Antonio Silva, and, of course, we all know, submitting Fedor Emelianenko via triangle armbar. So Verdum, a win here, could find himself in line for a at least a number one contenders matchup. Be interesting to see who the UFC line, lines him up with. Now, as I said, Verdum, we all know what this guy's all about. Eight wins by submission. He's never been tapped out. Easily one of the best grapplers, if not the best, in the heavyweight division. He's a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. He has a laundry list of accolades in the uh, grappling department and competitions out there. Now, Mike Russell, this guy's no slouch either on the mat. He is a Division One collegiate wrestler. Uh, give you a couple of the numbers that come his way. 5.06 takedowns per 50 minutes. He completes 48% of his takedown attempts. That's not bad. It's pretty impressive when you look at that. In his last fight, he took on another Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt, John Olavinamo, and the first thing he did is he rushed him, put the single leg, put him on the mat, which showed he had no fear of going to the ground with a guy like Inamo. And he won that fight, for the most part, on the basis of his wrestling. His ground game is solid. 
as I said, he has eight wins by submission, which is his biggest number. His striking is, we'll talk about it in a second, it's ne- certainly not something you want to be trying to win a fight with. Now, against Inamo, he had success controlling him and was able to win the fight because of his positioning. He did a nice job of preventing Inamo from attacking with too many submissions. But early on, Inamo did take his back and had success early, tied him up a couple times in the guard, used some wrist control, which gave Russell some issues. And now Russell didn't seem to find his, his success until later in that fight when Inamo started to uh, break down and get tired. And that was you know the turning point for Russell in that fight. He dropped some elbows and he hurt. He hurt you know, Inamo was clearly gassing in the fight. Eventually, I believe he got cut after that matchup. Now, Verdum... He's a great guy on the ground. There are not too many people lining up to jump into his guard. And that'll be the big thing. We haven't seen Verdum fight a wrestler or a guy who's going to look to try and take him down in a long time. The last guy that took him down with any, or opted to take him down was, uh, looking at my notes quickly, was actually Gabriel Gonzaga. He managed to take him down three times, and Verdum still won that fight. It was a long time ago. So basically, the word is out. You do not want to tangle with Verdum on the mat. We saw how the success he had against the very big Antonio Silva, who's also a black belt in BJJ. So is Russell going to take Verdum down? Maybe. Is he going to stay on stay in guard? Is he going to be able to stay in on top position? Is he going to have any success there for the duration? If he doesn't, that's a big issue for Russell. People are writing Russell off. The guy has the tools to win this fight. But basically, it's one thing. Top control, beat Verdum up, avoid submissions. That's going to be tough. Verdum's conditioning is not the greatest, but it's certainly not the worst. Against Overeem, we saw him get tired out by getting up and going down and getting up and going down. And against Nelson, the guy who did a heck of a lot of damage in the third round, he was looking a little bit tired. And that's the key to this fight as far as I'm concerned. Verdum's striking is vastly improving. He's working on his Muay Thai. The guy has a wicked arsenal of kicks. And his tie clinch with the knee shots that he dropped on against Nelson to any other fighter in the world they're probably going to sleep Nelson's got a chin like a cement uh, a cinder block or cinder block and that was impressive and uh, what I look at with Verdum his four career losses sorry four career losses five career losses you look at who they've come against Junior Dos Santos Alistair Overeem Andre Arlovsky and uh, Big Nog and Sergey Karatanov actually as well all guys who are, who are better strikers than for Doom and could hold either use the striking to avoid the ground game or hold their own on the mat. And that's the thing, Russell's not a better striker. He has grappling and that's what he needs to come with. Russell has a tendency to jump into his punches. He got hit a couple times by Inamo just basically with basic setups something, and Verdum's going to throw a lot more at him than Inamo did. And the big thing I look at here is Inamo was a world-class grappler and, and Russell was able to control him. Verdum is I would go as far as saying maybe it's probably a better grappler than Inamo, but he has certainly has more MMA experience uh, to fall back on, and that's going to make a difference. He knows how to handle himself on the ground, and I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see him more than willing to invite Russell down to the mat. And that'll be the turning point. If Russell says, no, you know, get up, that's when we know where this fight's going. And overall, I like what Verdum has been showing lately. Uh, Russell's a tough guy, and I think he has the ability to pull this one off. But I'm going to go with Fabrizio Verdum, and I think he's going to be eventually be able to take out Mike Russell. Mike Russell has a heck of a chin, but I think Verdum will eventually hurt him, drop him, and submit him. So I'm going to take Fabrizio Verdum to defeat Mike Russell by submission. We move now to the main event of the evening, which is a rematch between Vanderlei, the Axe Murderer, Silva, 34-11-1, and former UFC middleweight champion Rich Ace Franklin, 28-6-0. Quickly taking a look at their uh, recent history, Vanderlei's coming off a knockout victory over Kung Lee. Prior to that, he was stopped in only 27 seconds by Chris Lieben back at UFC 132. Rich Franklin lost his last fight against Forrest Griffin fighting in the lightweight division. And this is going to be a catchweight bout at 190 pounds. Uh, I've looked at it. There's different things explaining why. And basically what I've looked at is Rich Franklin maybe didn't have enough time to get down to the 185 comfortably, so they negotiated this. this is, people call this the Franklin weight class 190. People have vouched for a weight class in this range either way. But also this is going to be a five-round matchup, which is interesting. The first time they met was a three-round fight, which Rich Franklin won that matchup. We're very familiar with both these guys. So I really don't need to get into their overall skill types. Uh, Franklin... Fantastic conditioning. The guy can go at a high pace for a long time. You know, he doesn't push a ridiculous fast pace of, of some of the speedier fighters, but he's able to go for you know go for long periods of time and fight at a solid, even pace. He does a nice job. Vanderlei has conditioning issues. He's been working to improve them. Of course, he had the nasal surgery to help improve that situation. But again, against Kung Lee, 
we didn't see him push. We weren't, didn't see him push in that fight. And as a result, we weren't sure about his conditioning. Uh, prior to that, you know, in the Rich Franklin fight, going back to that matchup again, he looked faded in the, in the second half. He had bursts, but he wasn't able to continually push the pace like Rich did. Basically, Vanderlei comes in over his career, 24 wins by knockout. The guy's a warrior. He's been through ridiculous battles both in the UFC and Pride, but could be starting to catch up with him. He suffered six losses by uh, KO, including getting knocked out by Rampage, and of course they said Chris Lieben in the UFC. Which was certainly uh, and and which was certainly a tough way to go. And he got knocked out by Dan Henderson in his final Pride appearance back at Pride 33 in 2007. Rich Franklin, on the other hand, 50 wins by knockout, 10 by submission. It's a little more about diversity there and how he's able to finish his fights. He has been knocked out as well four times. If you look at the guys that have stopped Rich Franklin, Anderson Silva twice. Uh, Vitor Belfort was able to knock him out as well, and back in the day, back in 2003, he got knocked out by Leota Machida. So no shame in, no, and ne for really neither guy. The guys that have knocked him out are, are big-time strikers with a lot of talent. And you look at Franklin, he fought Dan Henderson, was able to survive that situation. You give him a lot of credit for that, because Henderson, we've seen what Henderson can do when he's able to land punches. Now, as far as the way I look at how this fight's going to break down, Vanderlei didn't impress me against Kung Lee. I thought he was losing the fight up until he, nailed, until he knocked him out. And I think that was just Kung Lee gassing and struggling with his first UFC octagon experience. Vanderlei, his, his style has basically degenerated into, he, he kind of is reserved, and then he'll attack in flurries with these crazy hooks and then back off. And sometimes they land and sometimes they don't. If he hurts somebody, he hits someone, that's, it's, it could be significant. But more often than not, he's either going to not land crisp or clean, or he's just not going to land at all. He will mix in some leg kicks, but certainly his variety of strikes and he becomes is, is not there, and he becomes very predictable. Rich Franklin mixes things up a little bit more, using his hands, using his footwork, coming in with angles. He has a very... Uh, Sorry, I wrote it down. Very solid leg kick, left leg kick, both the inside and the body, which can take a lot out of a fighter, especially if they already have conditioning issues. If Rich is able to land it with regularity, that could be big. Now, Vanderlei, we did see him take Rich down in the first fight. He caught a kick and put him on his back. But again, I don't expect that in this fight to see that too often. Rich is, is, pretty, is a pretty good ground fighter uh, in his career. He's never been submitted, and he's had 10 wins by submission. You know, Vanderlei, I believe he is a BJJ black belt, but over his, and he's never been submitted either, but over his career, yes, he is a black belt. He only has the three wins by submission, so not exactly a, you know, a glaring or a big time grappling uh, notoriety throughout his uh, run. Now, the way I see this fight playing out, Vanderlei will probably come out, and it'll be, there'll be a feeling out process early, uh, and I expect eventually they'll, they'll get to it. I like Rich's counters, I like his ability to, uh, to work the body and attack and mix things up against Vanderlei. Rich, of course, has issues with being knocked out. Like I said, he's going to need to watch Vanderlei's counter right off of Rich's left uh, leg kick wherever it goes. He did get clipped in the last fight, and he got hurt a couple times with it. But I think he'll be smart in this one. He'll look to uh, mix things up, stay on the outside. He does have a slight reach advantage, I believe, again, looking at that. Yeah, two inches is not significant, but still it is an advantage and that should help him. I think the kicks will help keep Vanderlei at a distance, and I like Rich Franklin's overall skill set at 190. I think it's, his strength shows up better here. He's slightly undersized at fighting at 205. Of course, eventually should be going back to 185. But either way, I think Rich Franklin will build on his uh, victory in the last fight. And the significant thing here is that five rounds, I think if, Vander, if Rich is able to, to land some body shots with his kicks and beat Vanderlei up, I think as the fight progresses, we're going to see Vanderlei slow down, and I think Rich is going to catch him in the second half of the fight, maybe late third round into the fourth or fifth at some point when Vanderlei slows down. So I'm going to take Rich Franklin to defeat Vanderlei Silva. I'm going to take him to, uh, to win this fight by knockout. So those are my predictions for the event. I know they're a little bit longer than what you're used to, but again, I only did four. You can check out the predictions from Joe Caporelli for the ultimate, two Ultimate Fighter finales on my website. Again, two events in two days, which is significant. I'm going to miss both of them, unfortunately. I'll have to catch them up later. The bet pack for UFC on FX will also include the four fights I talked about, my breakdowns for those fights, and betting breakdowns and props and everything else I talk about. So please pick up the bet pack for 10 bucks. I've actually I raised the price, but I'm doing a lot of work to put those packs together and give as much information to you guys as I possibly can. 
and I've had good response so far. I've had several people buy them. Actually, you know, I've you know more than usual, and they're new buyers, so you know, pretty happy with that. Either way, thank you very much for supporting me. I very much appreciate it. Check out the uh, prediction contest in, on my website, KamikazeOverdrive.net, with the forum. You have a chance to win a bet pack. Uh, password and get that for free. And as always, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much to all of my sponsors. The next one on the horizon is UFC 148. I look forward very much to that. Should be an excellent fight. Take care for now, and I'll talk to you later.